Welcome back to We Move Through Stormy Weather, a podcast by Storm Sound and Osiris Media. My name is Ryan Storm, and today I'm excited to be joined by Mike Rogi. Mike Rogi is an award-winning and losing editor and journalist. He is the editor and owner of Mountain Gazette, an outdoor culture magazine. Rogi has been writing about mountain culture professionally for over 20 years. He lives in North Lake Tahoe, California, with his wife, two sons, and dogs, Sonny and Quinn. Mike, how are you today? I'm doing well, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on today. Really excited uh, to talk to you, to learn more about uh, kind of your story. Uh, of course, everything there. Uh, really excited, of course, uh, to be contributing to Mountain Gazette uh, for a future issue this fall. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm very excited. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, we have a mutual friend in uh, Jeff from yes. Goose. And yes. uh we were grabbing coffee and I was like, Hey, do you know that kid, Ryan storm? And he said, yeah, you know, he's, he's pretty great. You know, he's actually become a friend of mine. And we got to chatting about what I was looking for in mountain Gazette contributors. And, you know, we've been dabbling in music for a couple issues now, and I'm really happy to have you part of our family. It's going to be cool to have you writing about music for us in the future. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you uh, to Jeff, of course, uh, man of the people as, as he is. Um, well, of course, since this is technically uh, a fish podcast, uh, you know, in origin, um, you know, I've, I've branched out a little bit, but I want to, I, you know, we've got to keep it connected to its roots. Uh, and so I know you have kind of a limited fish experience, uh, but let's let's start off with that. Tell me about your experience with fish. So I'm the one guy that lived in Burlington and loved the Grateful Dead. Right. So uh, um <laughs> I, I I don't think it's like a, you know, in the Northeast, it's like a Yankees Red Sox or maybe for you, like a Blue Jays Expos like type of thing. Like um, I just, they never, they never hit me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like they had gone, they, had, when I was in college, um, you know, they were on a hiatus. And so other jam bands like filled, you know, my jam band days. I was seeing Humphreys McGee. I was seeing Moe. Um, I was seeing uh, Assembly of Dust quite a bit. They were a great mm -hmm. band. Region Hour is actually a subscriber and a friend. And um, I've always loved live music. And unfortunately, like the time when I should have been going to fish shows and experiencing fish and seeing fish, they weren't playing. So um, I missed out on that and moved to California when I was 23 and promptly fell in love with the Grateful Dead. And the rest is history. Yes. Yeah, yes. as one yes. does when moving to California in their early twenties. You know, you, you I tried, Ryan. I tried. I, I have a friend, my college roommate, makes fun of me. I, I was like a huge hip hop fan. You know, uh, I graduated co um, high school in two thousand four, so I liked a lot of the bands from that time. You know, Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Red Hot Chili Peppers, like bands like that. And used to make fun of my friends that liked the Grateful Dead, and now here I am <laughs> with like seven or eight shows this summer for dead and company a couple more goose shows to see and then i live right down the road from the crystal bay club here in north lake tahoe so pigeons playing ping pong is coming into town soon kitchen dwellers were just here there you go so, yeah 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 that's kind of my music musical journey love it i love it well let, let's go go back a little bit from that uh music yeah. wise uh what kind of music were you listening to listening to growing up as a kid you know you mentioned high school uh and college yeah. a little bit but when you were growing up what kind of stuff was being played around the house um you know everything ryan like my parents um music was never off limits for us so yeah. um, a little bit of everything um being from New York, I was a big hip hop fan. Um, I loved, I came of age, like right as like the East coast, West coast rap rivalry was happening. So uh, I didn't have any stakes, you know, in that one. <laughs> you, were just so there, listened, you were there to have a good time and listen. Yeah, and, and innocent bystander and just to listen. And I, I always loved the early hip hop of like, you know, the Notorious B.I.G., uh, Jay-Z, um, Nas, a lot of New York rap, a lot of like, um, come up stories you know I, I grew up in a lower income household and uh, watched my dad kind of like create his business and come, really like come up in the world and so I could hear these hip-hop songs and while they weren't a direct one-to-one -one relationship I understood the idea of like working hard to try to succeed in life and get a little further along so I listened to a lot of that uh, embarrassingly enough and also I'm a little bit proud of it my first concert was Hootie and the Blowfish love it 
Yeah, uh, at Saratoga Performing Arts Center, where I'm actually going to be seeing our friends from Goose later this summer, which is kind of a trip for I, me. Yeah, I I was debating uh, that show. I don't know if I'm going to make it out there for that one, even though it's it's relatively close to me. Um, but it's a bit of a drive from Toronto. It's, you know it's I mean? like five or six hours, you know, which is yeah. You got to go through Buffalo and then just hit hit New York. But yeah, SPAC is a great venue and. You know, growing up, it was sort of a rite of passage in high school to go see Dave Matthews Band at SPAC. They used to play like two nights. Nice. Um, only only saw them there once. And then really the transformative show for me was I saw the Stone Temple Pilots uh, open up for the Red Hot Chili Peppers at SPAC. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of it for me. That was the first time I went to a show to, uh, you know, not just hang out with friends and like be with my friends and try to hit on right. girls, but like. I went to a show to see music and that was really, it was a different experience. It was really fun for me. And and that was kind of the beginning of the end. I've always been attracted and drawn to musicians and artists. And as a writer myself, like I've always been drawn to creative people. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I think seeing, seeing Scott Weiland perform live was really, really, really cool. I, I got into Stone Temple Pilots pretty hard after that. Love it. Yeah, it's it's similar. You kind of went through the the jam bandy pipeline and then had the experience with not a jam band. You know, like going to see a show for the music and and being drawn in by the music instead of you know the scene or the party or whatever is kind of like what I went through at age eleven, seeing my first fish show. Uh, you know, it was yeah, like a, a realization yeah, yeah. for me, like oh my god, like this is the best place on earth right now. You know, at any given time when they're playing. I like creators, Ryan. So like my freshman year of college um it's actually my son's godfather now i met this guy jared all-star haynes and he's one of new york's like best freestyle rappers wow of all time now again i'm not from the city i'm from the adirondacks i'm from the sticks so like again i met jared i had a camera and so i used to go to hip-hop battles i was the only white kid there and would film these battles for jared and it was really cool because he always won you know and like uh I, I think what I've always just enjoyed again is just people who are creative people that put all their passion into something they love. Mm-hmm. And I think you can really see that in the jam band world. It's oh, yeah. like uh, very few jam bands that I can think of like play for the paycheck. And, you know, yeah. I put that in, I put that in my article about goose of just like, you want to go see a band having a real experience, a real moment, seeing them perform live and, knowing that like what you're going to see that night is a work of art and it's something that you may never see again, you know, and it's not about playing the same tight 90 every time, you know, like it's, it's always different. So, yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you know, you're in writing now, but I'm curious, did, did you start out in film? You know, I've always, I've always shot photos. I've always filmed and I've always, uh, I've always written stories and, um, you know, I, I started, um, I'm, my background is primarily in skiing. And yeah. so I used to take my dad's VHS, like over the shoulder camcorder, just to go like film my friends skiing, just so we could see what it looked like. Right. And then I would play with angles. Like, what does it look like? You know, shooting photos. I took like a 35 millimeter film class in high school, uh, black and white. Mm-hmm. And I always felt like, um, you know, writing made the most sense to me because I didn't need anything. It was easy. I right. need a, I need a computer and Microsoft yeah. Word, and that was it. And um, but yeah, I, I've produced probably like forty or fifty films over my career. Um, most recently, like two years ago, I had a film in the Banff Mountain Film Festival called Finding Fury. Nice. Um, yeah, I directed a film on Kehinde Wiley. He's the artist that painted former President Barack Obama's presidential portrait i went to haiti with him for 14 days and published a book so um you could kind of tell my writing taste like i definitely have things that i love and i do all the time but yeah um, i'm willing to try anything i'm willing to try to write about anything or film anything or shoot um you know like uh, i've had a ton of photos published and a couple billboards from like commercial fishing shoots i've never commercially fished i couldn't i can barely like hook a worm i'm not an <laughs> angler i i don't i don't want to touch a worm even <laughs> so. yeah man i mean like you know what it is though ryan is like I, what i found at the core of all this is that like people who are passionate in their life have really great stories to tell yeah 
And whether that was writing a profile of someone or shooting a photo campaign for a brand or making a film about them, like I always found the work was pretty easy if the people involved were genuinely giving a shit about it. So that's always been a guiding principle for me is just working with people on a human level and trying to get, you know, get to the core of what they love and, and telling that story to other people. Yeah. So tell me about how, you know, through all of that, you know, what you, what were you doing in the years leading up to your acquisition of Mountain Gazette? You know, like what I, I know you worked in various uh, yeah. mediums or media, uh, if you will. Um, tell me, tell me about that journey. Sure. Like I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. So I, um, you know, for a comedian, you want to get a tight bit and end up on maybe Saturday Night Live, right? Like that's right. like the be all end all. Um, as a musician, maybe you want to sell out like Red Rocks or something like that. You know, that'd be like the be all end all. For me as a ski writer, it was getting to Powder Magazine. And so I got to Powder Magazine pretty young. I was 23 years old and they hired me. I was the youngest editor in their history. Um, and I had a license to steal, man. I got to do everything. I had to travel around the world, fly in helicopters, just interview really interesting people, meet amazing local mountain town people. It was great. And after three years, I got totally burnt out. I left and I freelanced for about eight years. And in that process, I kind of learned what I loved about making magazines and making media and what I disliked. Mm -hmm. and what I found was typically what I disliked, consumers actually disliked too. And so I had an opportunity to acquire Mountain Gazette. I took it. I bought it right before the pandemic. Um, we launched it on June of 2020 and probably sold out of our first issue in about six to eight weeks. And we, we only, only print, I mean, I'm not trying to make it sound bigger than it is. Like we, we sold, we made a thousand copies. And my thought was if I can sell 500 of these, this will be great. And right. we sold a thousand copies and it just kept growing from there. And it's been my full-time gig now for three years. That's, so. that's amazing. I, I was going to say, going back to your, your point about, you know, what you wanted, um, you know, kind of reflecting what the consumers want. And I feel like that's really important kind of being your own target demographic. Uh, yeah. you know, that's something, that's something I learned. Like a lot of the content that I'm doing now, like, you know, my three podcasts, my writing, whatever I'm catering to people like me who are insanely nerdy about music and want to listen to other people and read other people be insanely nerdy about music. Um, which is, a, I right. think a really cool thing to realize, you know, be your own target demographic. And like now we're actually growing to the point where we're, you know, we're big enough where we're running these, you know, customer surveys and finding out what our consumers really want. And the biggest yeah. thing they want is they're like, man, we feel like all media is paid and planned and like, it's, it's not improvised. It's that tight 90 we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, our readers want to be surprised first and foremost, like more than anything, they can see, BS coming from a mile away or a kilometer away, if you will. And <laughs> they do, they, they want to see something that surprises them. And so with issue 198, we did our first music feature. I wrote my first feature for the Gazette. It was on our favorite band goose. I'm just going to assume it's one of your favorite bands, but absolutely. Um, yeah. And now we've got 199 out. We have a feature in there by Doug Schnitzbahn, who's a former mountain Gazette editor about the kitchen dwellers and mountain biking. And kind of our, our take on it, Ryan, is that, you know, you'll be in the next issue writing about a band. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is not so much uh, tell the story about what happened at a concert or review an album or anything like that. What we found is like our readers want to talk about how music affects them in their life, like personally, like how it impacts them, how that like on the crappiest day of their life, they heard the right song and it turned everything around, you yeah. know, or searching for the words to talk to a friend that just suffered a tragic loss. That's what this kitchen dweller story is about in 199 and, and not being able to find them, but letting the music of the kitchen dwellers kind of take that place of what you can't say. And I think that's the point of music ultimately in all art is that it's cool to look at, right? It's cool to listen to whatever, but none of us have that experience. We like feel it in our bones. And, and I think that's the point of what we're trying to do with the Gazette is to make people feel things again. Yeah. In their bones. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really fun journey. That's, that's amazing. I was, I was going to ask, I'm, I'm really curious as somebody who has been, you know, 
a ski writer and, you know, focusing so much on sports uh, in a lot of what you've been doing, was there a time that you kind of lost touch with music and then kind of reconnected with it uh, recently that made you want to feature it prominently in a couple of issues? Or has it always kind of been there look in looking for the opportunity to work it in uh, to what you do? Yeah, I think like um, it's always been there, but it's about where it's sitting. I guess with me, if it's in the front seat or if it's in the back seat or if it's not right. in the car at all, it's always been there. I mean, I'm always listening to music, but um, when I moved to Southern California, I was pretty, it was, I was pretty blown away by how uh, this was at the time. I don't, I couldn't speak to it now, but the music scene was not very good when I moved it out here um, in Southern California. I was in Orange County. I was young. I was looking for any kind of band. It was a lot of like, um, like ska cover bands and like just, you could tell it was people that were like, Hey, I have a band and they'll pay me. And so I'm right. going to play and that's it. Um, you know, I'd see the same band five weeks in a row, same sets, same joke, same. Everything. And you're like, okay, I guess I'm going to a new bar now. Right. Um, but for me, like, say, I've I, seen goose 16 times already this year. Like, yeah, the different shows. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen the same show, right? Like that's yeah. it. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm 37 and I have a four-year-old and I have an almost one-year-old son. And I think like one of the things that happens when you have a kid is uh, your life slows down a little bit. You have a little more time. Actually, people think you have less time, but you actually have a lot more time to like think about things. And if you don't believe that, spend five minutes with a baby that needs a diaper change when you don't need to change it. We don't know how to, you know, and you're like, oh my God, what do I do? do?" Like that is the longest five minutes of your life. So I started putting on some dead and company shows. I started putting on some old assembly of dust shows. I still have favorite shows from AOD from when I was in college and yeah, a local bartender here in Tahoe uh, turned me on to goose and my father-in-law turned me on to goose. And I, I honestly, dude, I just thought they were good. Yeah. Like I wasn't like, these guys are blowing me away. It was ever, but what I liked is like, I could tell as I listened to more shows that they were getting better. They were doing more things. They weren't relying on the same jokes. Like every night was a new show. And I'm like, man, these people are actually pretty present, you know, and looking mm-hmm. forward. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it just made sense. It made sense. You know, I, I noticed that like Peter and Rick were, were outdoorsy people. I noticed that Jeff was posting stuff from outside, you know, whether it be disc golf or whatever, and thought, okay, maybe, maybe now's our time. You know, the Gazette was found in 1966. They'd written about music before. Yeah. And I wanted to reestablish the roots with sports. Um, and then once we had that, you know, expand. And now we'll do music. Maybe we'll do some culinary stuff. Maybe we'll do some art. Like, I, I think that mountain culture is multifaceted. And music's certainly a part of it. So. I love it. I love yeah. it. And we're we're kind of, you know, bouncing uh, from topic to topic, kind of going backwards and forwards a little bit because I I'm I just I love the way that you're kind of crafting this narrative. Uh, but I want to go back a little bit just talking about kind of the history of the Mountain Gazette. Sure. Uh, you know, you said it was, it was founded in the 60s, it was defunct for a little while and then you revived it uh, a few years ago. So, take me through Mountain Gazette's history. Sure. It was founded in 1966 in Colorado by a guy named Mike Moore. Um, he wanted to do something different. Um, it was described back then as the village voice of mountain culture. It's always been mountain culture. It was never so much sports. It was never about who climbed something the highest, the fastest, whatever. It was always about like, here's something weird. Right. Uh, my favorite example of that is they took money from the Colorado tourism board one time to do a story called the most scenic highways of Colorado. And they ran 12 photos of roadkill on highways in Colorado and encouraged tourists to slow down. So it's always been a little tongue in cheek. It's always been a little like uh, left to center. And so the mag had a great run. Hunter S. Thompson wrote for it. Edward Abbey wrote for it. Wow. Uh, um, It has this really strong lineage. The founder of the North Face, uh, the founder of Patagonia, uh, all wrote for it, all advertised in it. Like the roots of mountain culture as we know it today on a big level uh, started in the Mountain Gazette in the 60s and 70s. It closed in 1979. Uh, just due to, you know, poor economic times and bad business strategy, it, it happens. And yep. then was resurrected by a writer, John Fahey, who is in our current issue. He'll actually be in the issue you're writing for too. Uh, in 2000, 
had a good run till 2012, sort of lost its way towards the end of that run, became like a, a monthly that was doing like beer reviews, gear reviews, was free and coffee. And just, it wasn't essential. And right. so I bought it in 2020, resurrected it. And the idea was we don't do gear. We don't do profiles of big athletes. We write about what we feel is essential mountain culture. Like we're holding up the mirror. Um, like for example, the band you're writing about, I think is deeply rooted in mountain culture. And I have, I don't think I've ever seen an outdoor magazine write about them, if you can even believe that. So it's right. like, yeah. So I feel like that that's our that's kind of our our deal now. Yeah, we're gonna keep teasing people on what what this band is uh, until yeah. until it comes out, which I'm excited about. One thing I'm really curious about uh, with the Mountain Gazette, you know, it's it's 2023. Everything is online. Everything is on people's phones, and the Mountain Gazette is only available in print. You know, if you're that's a subscriber, right. you get it. You can't read it online anywhere. There's no digital copy that you can get. It's only in print. So how do you build a community around a print-only medium like this in the year 2023? So you build it digitally, right? And what you do is you build it around um, you build around the community. And the community never goes away. Right. But what's cool is to have them rally around something. Um, you know, like – if you have a, a Nugs account, a Spotify account, a Netflix account, the irony is that you don't own any of the content. You're leasing it from them. You pay a monthly fee, they give you access to it, but you don't yeah. own it. And so what do you do? Well, if you like um, a Rebelo, you buy the vinyl, right? Yeah. And why would you buy vinyl? You can get that on Apple Music. Well, it's, you own it. It's different. It's yours. And what you do with it, you can give it to a friend. You can feature it prominently in your living room. You know, you can listen to it with a with a buddy. You can you can share it, like truly share it. I don't mean like share it on Twitter, or Instagram, or anything like that. So with our magazine, what we want to do is we made it really big, we made it durable, um, limited the advertising, and we put content in there that will be awesome when you read it the day it arrives, and yeah. also like maybe six seven years down the line. And I think the key of that is how do you build a community around that you say like look we're not trying to sell you anything if you subscribe our job's done we've already sold what we wanted to sell you yeah the rest of it's easy like recruiting you to write for mountain gazette 200 right like that's me fulfilling the promise to my subscribers that we're going to surprise them with something new i guarantee some of our subscribers have definitely read your stuff ryan they've listened to this podcast but most of them probably haven't so they're going to be psyched that offline they're going to meet you. And then our job digitally year round when we're not publishing is on our Sunday email to be like, Hey, Ryan put out a new podcast. Remember Ryan from Mountain News at 200. And so our audience follows you digitally. Like you can, you can take our community where you want to take them if they're interested in your stuff, you know, like Ari Schneider, who's an investigative reporter for us. Like you can follow Ari to the guardian, or wherever else, Sadie Stein, you can follow her to the New York times, Jason Roman. You can follow him to Jason Momoa's feed where he's shooting photos for him. Like right. our, our writers and photographers are everywhere online. And so we don't need, I mean, Baratunde Thurston who has a show on PBS, you know, like you can follow him there. So um, it's not that we're creating the community. We're just holding up the mirror and showing people, this is what, we believe a, you know, hip, affluent, you know, interesting community looks like in 2023. Yeah. And I think we're just the gathering place. And I think the right medium has always been print for that. that that's amazing. That's, that's really, you know, inspiring to hear something like that. Because again, in 2023, most of what people are thinking about and how to put out content is all digital. You know, you're not yeah. thinking about, you're not thinking about, going out to the store and buying coffee table books anymore. Even me who I like just reading books all the time. I read books on my phone now because yeah, it's so much it's more great. convenient and I can do it with my digital library card. Right. Even though I, yeah. I love the feel of reading a real book, I'm still doing it all digitally because it's easier. And so it's amazing uh, to hear that, like, you know, first of all, you're so passionate about creating this kind of community and, and seeing this kind yeah. of community and that that community is out there and people are like, hell yeah, I want this giant coffee table, you know, uh, Mountain Gazette to come in a few times a year. Like, hell yeah, I want to have the physical copy and, and get involved I just think in it's, that way. It's, it's different. So like, I would say um, 
here's how I compare it. Like I always think of media like food. Yeah. And so, um, uh, let's see, like, uh, Mr. Action, right. The goose song that mm-hmm. came out and I think it was like, like it's on Goosemas, right? Maybe it was where they it did was that the, one. The Boulder, the Boulder show after Goosemas. <laughs> The uh, Boulder show it. after Goose yeah. was exactly. So uh, you can use that in your Instagram stories or on TikTok now, and you get to use 15 seconds of Mr. Action, and it's right. awesome, right? Now you've seen Goose a couple times. I'm sure they play that song for you. Would you yes. ever think, in any way possible, that that 15 second TikTok video of Mr. Action could encapsulate what you experienced, what you could hear, see, sense, taste? like all of it like right not at all yeah it's all exactly and so that's to me the difference between digital and physical media right like the idea of like you know listening to a record on your turntable versus my parents turntable versus my turntable like you know my house is at seven thousand feet like maybe it sounds different elevation like right maybe i suck at cleaning like i just think there's like so many parts of life that are worth living yeah. And digital is a really quick, easy way. To me, digital is like the fast food of media. It's quick. It's easy. It's right there. It's cheap. Sometimes yeah. it's free even if well, you're it's lucky. Like, you it's know, like webcasting yeah. a show versus being at the show. You know, not nothing totally. is ever going to be able to replicate the experience of actually Dude, being there in the room. 100%. 100%. I mean, I was not on the East Coast for those Trey Goose concerts, but they played mm-hmm. Guns Falls, which I was born – that was on a my birthday. Block away. Yeah, dude, really? No way. I was born a block away. Oh, from wow. Where that show was. So I had a ton of friends there. I live streamed it. But you know what I liked about it? I could pause it. I could put my kid to bed. I could throw right. a pacifier in my son's mouth. I could like bake dinner. Whatever. That was nice. But I have friends that still talk about that show because they were there. They loved it. I think it was worth Thatch. Like yes, it was. And it's like, dude, what a heavy, heavy jam for Glens Falls, New York, right? To see um my friends got to feel it experience you know like hear rick's guitar like really get into it i watched it yeah but i don't have i don't have that affinity for thatch like they do like that's their jam that's that's even cool. after seeing it at the warfield i loved it at the war well that Warfield that's, shows that's the best version they've played so far i mean i'm i'm not gonna lie that every everything must go is my uh that's yeah i think you know, we were backstage there and, and I just think Rick's getting, like, they're all getting better. That's what's fun about, for me, wa- like, watching and listening to that band is yeah. getting better. Rick's a great writer. People will talk about so guitar good. playing all day long, but oh, dude's yeah. a good writer. Dude's a good writer. He so, Not Alone, uh, which they played yeah. Night 2 of the Warfield as well. Rick yeah. wrote, like, you know, 15 years ago or something and then has just been kind of keeping in his back pocket until they they just debuted it in March. Yeah. It's you know, so Rick, Rick and his Rick and his songwriting partner, Matt Campbell, who's also an amazing guy. Yeah. The two of them are incredible together. Um, and, you know, just like that, as always, um, I'm talking about Goose again uh, on a fish yeah. podcast, which well, know, I, what, it keeps what happening. I will say, <laughs> what I will say is that, you know, in our Goose feature, we ran that uh, Adam Berta shot of Trey and Peter holding bananas. Which, oh, yeah. We got a ton of feet. It was crazy, dude. This like small photo and this big goose feature, which so many people hit up like, dude, you win. That's the first time Trey's ever been in an outdoor magazine, which blows my mind. That blows yeah. my mind that no one's been doing that. But um, yeah, man, I, I feel like, you know, that thing that just happened between us about what we love about music and everything there are people that feel that way about rock climbing, about skiing, about yeah. making food. Those are the people that I want writing for us and I want their photos in our magazine and everything. And so what's cool is that digital media, I'm guilty of it myself. We run paid ads, all that stuff up for Mountain Gazette to try to get people to learn about the magazine and, and subscribe to it. Yeah. When you get the magazine, it's unfiltered. It's no bullshit. It's just like, this is how we, This is these are people who feel something about something and you get to react to that. And I, I do feel like there's a deficiency in that in 2023, which is probably why we stand out as a print medium, you know, just yeah. being a little different. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And like, I mean, that do it, talking to you, you know, this last half hour has just made me even more excited uh, to write for issue 200. Uh, yeah. Good. To be part of, to be a part of something so amazing. So thank you again uh, so yeah. much for having me. 
you know, I'm really excited to, to be able to put that out and I'm excited to read, uh, you know, the whole mountain gazettes, uh, including your goose feature, uh, you know, like that it, it is, it's so well written, uh, especially for someone who, you know, has been writing about skiing, uh, for as long as you have, and not as much about music. Like it's just reading that article. I felt your emotion listening to the music and getting to know the band. And it's, it's one of those things that, as we know, like, and, and people in the goose community, even who haven't met the band, you can tell that they are the same genuinely amazing people that they come across as on stage in real life. Yeah. And that oh, I yeah. think is really important for the community as well. Um, and that really comes across uh, in, in your writing, you know, you're just your realization, like these guys are the real deal. Like, you know, they can play, they can sing and they're awesome. Yeah. You know, man, I didn't put it in the article, but you know, I had a newborn baby and at that point, a three-year-old and I was a little nervous, man. I was going to write my first, you know, music story and go backstage and see this band. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, like, they are about to run circles around me. These guys probably party super hard. It's probably like lights out for me. It's over. And I show up and like, they come off sound check. And I think Ben, um, and Ben, if, it, if this wasn't you and you're listening, like I apologize, but Ben was like, yo, Sam, where was that dope ass vegan milkshake spot? And I'm thinking like, nice, these guys are chill as hell. Like they were yeah. just like, <laughs> so approachable. Like, we're just like, oh, cool. Well, Croy, nice. We're drinking like soda water. Man. Like, they are, um, they're genuine. They truly give a shit about their fans, which yeah. is really the craziest. Cool. The craziest thing that happens backstage on any given night is Jeff skateboarding around like that. Yeah. You know, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> what was really cool was that after that, um, Jeff actually wasn't around for the interview that we did. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of known now for being a man of the people and going out and just kind of walking around town, checking stuff out. So he showed up last minute and then he got into skiing uh, with Sam, their, their tour manager. And so yeah. he texted me and was just like, dude, give me the rundown. Like what skis do I need? Where do I get my boots fitted? And I grew up in the East coast. So I'm like, dude, you're in Connecticut. This is the best boot fitter in Vermont. You need to go here. These are your ski brands. These are everything you need. And yeah, we've struck up a, a cool little friendship and, I think it's one of mutual respect, you know, like I obviously respect the hell out of the music he makes. And I think they're all digging it as far as like, it was a pretty surreal moment for John, who's a, probably a bigger music fan than I am. He plays live in upstate New York, John Coleman, our art director. But like when they played Play in the Sand, you know, Jeff's wearing a Mountain Gazette t-shirt next to Bobby Weir. And we're just like, right. damn, that's kind of wild. So yeah, that's amazing pretty fun so yeah a fish podcast where we talked about goose and the grateful dead the whole time i apologize to fish fans uh, <laughs> i hope you get that i hope you get that tweezer you're desperately waiting for um there you go you know you know how to appeal to the the fish demographic and you know we got we got to get you to a few more shows see if it uh see if it clicks it could click who knows anything's who knows? possible right. anything's possible i'm open anything's I'm possible open well it. before we wrap up really quick three things in the next year uh, that are coming either from Mountain Gazette or you personally that you're really excited for. And it can't just be three issues of Mountain Gazette. <laughs> well, we only do two issues a year, so okay. I'm lucky on that. Okay, so I think uh, professionally, I'm, I'm very, very excited that this magazine that's been around for a long time that died two deaths, that my team and I have shepherded it to 200 issues. That feels like a really cool thing that we're doing um i'm actually gonna go write my second feature for mountain gazette with my dad in upstate new york i'm really excited to go home uh, That's awesome you know uh james joyce is a hero of mine and he wrote the hell out of dublin and so i'm hoping that i can not be james joyce but write the hell out of the adirondacks for a bit and um let's see a third thing that i am very excited about in the next year you know, I'm going to see a lot of music this year. And yeah. I think any young parent that's listening can tell you that like you do kind of some of your personal life takes a step back when you have kids. And thankfully I've got two really good kids and an amazing wife and great family. And so we're, we're psyched. We're going to bring the boys to a show probably later this summer. We're not totally sure what it is, but we have, it's California. So we have a lot of outdoor music, maybe like high Sierra nice. or something like that. That's nearby. Yeah. Um, but you know, man, like I'm, I'm just, 
I'm happy for today. I'm happy that we're on, I'm on this pod. I'm happy you're writing for us. And uh, Mountain Gazette is in a really great position. We're comfortable. We're safe. There's no corporate overlord coming to shut us down and stop the fun. Like, I don't know. It's We get to keep doing this. And I think that's yeah. the point, right? It's just that's to wake amazing. up every day and be happy you can do it. You know, I got to ski 100 plus days this year and see Goose a couple times. And I'm still showing up to T-ball. That's why we have a hard out is I've got to go coach the Mountain Gazette Giants to their first oh, victory. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm happy about everything right now. So. Oh, but I, I'm I'm also very happy uh, that you're on this pod. This has been uh, an awesome episode. It's been great, you know, kind of getting getting in your head a little more, knowing uh, you know, kind of the history behind all of this. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm so excited to be writing for issue 200. So thank you again for that. Thank you, everybody uh, who's listening to this episode. Uh, listening to this episode of We Move Through Stormy Weather. Uh, of course, a couple quick things in Storm Soundland. Uh, if you have enjoyed this Goose Talk uh, and you don't know about Always Almost There, of course, that is the Storm Sound Goose podcast. Uh, we do tour recaps in the day after every single Goose show at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We do a live podcast recap. So, Mike, next time you see Goose, you need to let me know so we can get you on one of those. And Let's do one from my van, live from my van outside yes. of SPAC. Done. Let's do it. That'd be Done. great. And then also, if you are into Snarky Puppy uh, and you don't know, we recently launched, and by recently, I mean a couple of months ago, we just launched Things of Gold, uh, where we are taking a dive into Snarky Puppy's live catalog. Uh, so check that out as well. It's myself and co-host Megan Glyona from HF Pod. We're having a great time with that. Um, and it's awesome. And, you know, this episode's coming out pretty soon after we're recording it. So everybody who's going to see live music, there's a lot happening. You know, summer's... Summer's pretty much here, you know, shows are happening outside, people are having a great time, so an amazing time, whatever you're doing, you know, share with us what you're seeing, what you're listening to at Stormy Podcast on social media. Thank you again, Mike, so much for being here today. And My pleasure. Thank you, everybody, once again, for listening. I'll see you 